सो रूपाल सी हेयर आर सम सीनियर मेंबर्स ऑफ द आईआरएसए आर प्रेजेंट हेयर एज प्रोफेसर आशा राज पुरोहित मैडम एंड मनोरमा साक्षी एंड अदर्स फ्रेंड्स Uh, Manorma ji, can you listen us? Uh, yes, I can hear you, Vikas ji. Hello. Oh, good evening. Oh, uh, good evening. Good evening. Yes. हाँ रूपांशी जी हेलो
सर यू हैव ज्वाइन सर ओके सर थैंक यू सर थैंक यू ओके सर थैंक यू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू और सर रूपांशी जी हेलो रूपांशी जी हाँ रूपांशी जी हाँ जी सर है ज्वाइन सो यू कैन नाउ स्टार्ट ओके 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 Hi, very good evening, everyone. Welcome to Indian Research Scholars. Today we have a special lecture on the value chains, spin pattern, and consequences. We deliver by our distinguished and able chief guest, that is Professor Sani. So also we have Gus Vikas Kumar, who is the co-leader of the organization. Also we have with us co-convener Ravin Kumar, Papi. And Secretary Manuma Kudar. So now I just request Ras Kumar, please welcome our guest, Professor Vikramani. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Vikas, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Rupansi, madam. Actually, uh, uh, my health is uh, not good, so I will uh, give my address in brief. so uh, first of all uh, i would like to welcome uh, to professor c b ramani sir uh, professor and director of center for social studies uh, tiruvannamalai kerala uh, because uh, 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 i was trying to sir previous 3 uh, 4 uh, months uh, so finally uh, Uh, we have uh, taken the uh, acceptance uh, uh, from the professor Bira Manisar side. So I would like to welcome uh, on the bottom of my heart to uh, professor uh, Bira Manisar for accepting uh, uh, our uh, request. And uh, sir has also uh, selected a very uh, uh, relevant topic. Uh, which is necessary for the all academic persons and the research scholars uh, i would like to welcome to uh, the uh, convener of this uh, uh, lecture series uh, uh, papi haldar and uh, co convener uh, rupan singh uh, praveen and uh, uh, organizing secretary and uh, also uh, uh, our friend manorma kuntal Uh, and all participants all uh, i can see on the screen uh, uh, many uh, uh, members of the ir executive committee members irsa has uh, joined this session i can see professor uh, asara grohit uh, madam professor uh, sakshi singh uh, chandrabhal and uh, some of the scholars had joined uh, from the out of the uh, uh, country i think professor isaullah khan has joined from the uh, 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 afghanistan i think and uh, mujahida has joined from the tajikistan so uh, 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 on the behalf of me and on the behalf of the indian research scholars association i would like to welcome to the all participants and uh, again i would like to welcome to uh, 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 professor veera uh, mani sir uh, Uh, so again i request to uh, uh, rupansi uh, please see the part that proceeding thank you over to you rupansi ji <coughs> thank you vikas sir as you all know the professor again is very distinguished boy and uh, at present he is a uh, director as cds in police tiruvannamalai uh, so i thank you all and it's an honor for us to listen you so i request all of you to please sit back and hear his valuable thoughts on global value chain so uh, welcome you so, okay. thank you
ओके ओके सो रूपाल सी बिफोर दिस सर लेक्चर to invite to papi helder for the brief introduction of the uh, respected biramani sir please invite to papi helder yeah i also invite papi helder she is a me this side welcome ma'am okay very good evening to one yeah. and all uh, in this, yes i am audible Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes, yes. You are audible. Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Okay. Okay. Very good evening to one and all present in this online session on the topic of value chains, trends, patterns, and consequences, which is organized by Indian Research Scholar Association. I am Poppy Haldar from Bangladesh, Research Scholar, Department of Commerce, University of Lucknow. Today. we have with us an eminent personality professor c bhiramani sir and it's my proud privilege to introduce sir to this online session presently professor c bhiramani sir is a professor and director center for development studies uh, tiruvananthapuram he was the professor of indira gandhi institute of development research igitr he has completed his phd in economics Center for Development Studies (CDS) from Jawaharlal Nehru University in 2003 under the JRF from UGC. MPhil in Applied Economics (CDS) (JNU) in 1999 under the Institutional Fellowship. MA in Development Economics, Dr. John Matthew Center, University of Calicut, Kerala in 1997. He was the fellow of. Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations New Delhi also he was the visiting fellow in Crawford School of Public Policy Australian National University in 2010 he has more than 20 years of teaching and research experience he has many advisory roles for the government like uh, he contributed chapter 5 creating jobs and growth by specializing to exports in network products of economic survey 2019-20 ministry of finance government of india he was the member of rbi empowered committee on external commercial borrowings and overseas direct investments he was the invited participant at the two rounds of pre budget consultation meeting industry services and trade with the finance minister of india sir has many honoring positions like member of board of management igitr dean students welfare and grievance igitr member of board of studies bengaluru dr b r ambedkar school of economics university member of board of studies in economics goa university member of Euro european masters in law and economics examination board Co coordinator of indian development reports published by oxford university press he has so many affiliations and appointments i just mentioned a few he has contributed a lot a uh, lot of administrative activities and editorial services besides this sir has lots of awards like australian leadership award exim bank international economic development research award medal finalist in eighth annual global development conference beijing china in 2000 2007 uh, medal finalist in seventh annual global development conference st petersburg russia in 2006 he has many publication to his credit like books referred articles in journals referred articles in edited volumes unreferred articles in books and journals book reviews discussion papers and working papers in reputed national and international journals the area of interest of sir are international trade industrial economics foreign investment and labor market this is a very brief introduction of sir so we are so honored to have with us for this online session thank you very much sir we are eagerly waiting for your lecture now i hand over the session to rupan ji thank you all thank you professor sir rupan ji ah rupan ji i think uh, uh, there are some problem so uh, directly i would like to request to uh, uh, professor c b ramani sir uh, sir uh, your most welcome uh, this platform is your so now uh, 
you can start the lecture sir thank you so much thank you thank you dr vikas kumar and uh, dr papihi khalta uh, am i audible yes sir am i audible yes sir yeah yes. so so how much time uh, uh, is available for this talk what is your schedule it's depend on you sir because our participant it's so much interested for your lecture so it will be depend on you so uh, first of all I, my apologies for the delay because uh, there was some issue with my you know network here so um, uh, so the topic of discussion today is about the global value chains uh, and uh, its uh, measurement its determinants consequences so this is what uh, uh, we i have given as the topic but before coming to that because uh, dr vigash kumar told that you know you uh, the participants here come from uh, different backgrounds and uh, many of them may not be interested on this topic uh, because that is not directly related to what they are doing and he suggested to me that you know is it possible to give a talk on Uh, research methodology, which is of uh, you know interest to uh, most uh, most participants. So um, so I I promised to him that I will talk uh, my initial few uh, some time I will spend on uh, some issues related to research methodology, and then I will move on to uh, the specific topic of today's discussion, and I will also try to kind of um, you know motivate you. to um, to to say uh, to convince you uh, that uh, understanding of uh, these issues related to global value chain is important for everyone like you know whether you work in um, uh, in different fields some of you may be working in agriculture some of you may be working in uh, industry some are not in economics may, you may be in sociology politics uh different backgrounds so uh, my purpose is to kind of try to convince you that whichever area that you are specialized in and whatever area you uh, are working uh, an understanding of this issue is uh, relevant uh, for any anyone uh, who who is generally interested uh, in development you uh, know issues like uh, uh, not just uh, only economists even others who are broadly uh, uh, whose interest falls in the broad area of development um, will find that uh, an understanding of issues related to global value chains are important for them as well so i will come to that but before that you know because we see these days so much of uh, workshops uh, and uh, you know events uh, around uh, research methodology Uh, uh to understand make people understand what research methodology is and etc now um i have not given many lectures in that uh, research methodology workshops mainly because i feel that the research is something that you need to learn by doing uh, it is very difficult someone to teach how to do research it's generally uh, it's like a saying that you know uh, we teach someone how to how to do cooking so if you want to become a good cook you have to start cooking then you will learn uh, you know whether you are uh, the the dish that you prepare is it tasty or not uh, acceptable or is it acceptable to the people whom you serve so similarly and then from that you learn how to improve your cooking so that way research is the same so you have to start doing it the best way of uh, learning research methodology is by reading reading what reading uh, good journal articles you uh, know the frontier research that is going on in your field that would be mostly journal articles so when you um, read very good journal articles from best journals in the world in your respective field and see how people are doing uh, research you will understand what is research methodology there is no shortcut to that right so there is only hard way of learning it the hard way of learning is to uh, read the best articles from the best journal uh, the articles from the best journal from by the best people in the world and then see how are they writing papers and what is the research uh, method that they follow um, uh, and and then you start to you know follow them take them as your role model and try to 
uh, do similar things from that process you will learn research methodology there is no other easy way of uh, learning it one cannot teach the method of doing research uh, in a lecture so uh, so that is what i feel but be, uh, but it, having said that i just wanted to say some general aspects about why we need to think about research methodology uh, as a kind of um, you know a separate field so one way i i think that it is important still to think about research methodology as a separate field uh, because uh, we know that as social scientists we are all trying to understand the world the the, the society that we are living in and our world we, an economist will be trying to understand the economic uh, aspects of this world a sociologist will try to understand uh, you know social issues uh, through their lens similarly political scientists would be looking at again world uh, and society through the particular uh, discipline they are trained in now all of us are interested in understanding the world in whichever way right we are all interested in understanding the world now we know that the world is very complex place right it is not a simple place so there are all kind of complex uh, type of interactions take place among different uh, agents uh, in this world like you know uh, uh, since i am an economist i can say that there are consumers there are uh, individuals act as consumers they supply uh, factors of production they supply inputs for production then individuals are also producers there are firms then there is government you know there are all these different uh, different um, uh, you know agents they interact uh, each other each one of them have a uh, their own objectives and they try to maximize uh, whatever you know their particular objective is uh, their goal they try to maximize so like that it is a very complex world all people do not think in the same way right if there are all kind of uh, peculiar peculiarities all firms uh, or all producers or all consumers do not think in the same way we have a, you know because of that we have what is called the under area called behavioral economy because people think in different ways and so the world is very complex world it is not a simple world now we are trying to make sense of the complex world that is what the researchers are trying to do we are trying to make sense of this very complex world now if we are trying to make sense of this very complex world we should have some method at our disposal to do that right otherwise uh, we will end up doing something which is very confusing and uh, whatever that you do as a research should not be a complex thing it should be something that uh, people should uh, understand easily so so your job as a researcher is to make the complex world a little bit easier for people to understand right that is our job our job is to uh, use our method to make the world a little bit easier for other people to understand. So if you can make the world um, simpler and easier, the actual real world is complex, but if you can somehow try to make it simple, then you become a successful researcher, right? So that is what, uh, that is what our job is. Now, how do we do, a, how do we go about it? The way to go about it is like what is called modeling. It's called a model. In economics, we have an economic model. In sociology, we have soci uh, sociology-related framework. In, uh, in, in uh, political science also, we have a political science uh, model. So in all these models, whether we call it models or theory or framework, or whichever way we call it, the essential thing is we are doing abstraction. We do some kind of abstraction. So because if you don't do that abstraction, uh, then what happens is that we are dealing with a very complex world. We cannot explain each and everything that we see in this very complex world. If we try, try to explain each and everything that we see in this complex world, then our research is as complex as the real world itself. So then we are not making any contribution to understand this complex world. So our job is not just to do a replication of the world. If we just replicate the world, through our research, then that is not a useful research because 
everybody know that the world is very complex and your research is also as complex as the world then what is your contribution you are just replicating a complex phenomena that will not uh, help anybody to understand anything so that is why we need to do abstraction abstraction is very important model building is important theory is important conceptual framework is important so whichever way we call it right some people call it a theoretical model somebody call it a conceptual framework whichever way so we have to do essentially some level of abstraction to understand the world the complex world to make matters simple and uh, uh, straightforward and more easy for us to understand and also the model help us to kind of you know have some kind of discipline the discipline in the way in which we uh, look at things because if we uh, lack focus uh, on what we are trying to do uh, then then again uh, we will not be contributing something useful so we have to uh, have that discipline in our approach a framework help us to have that discipline so for me research methodology essentially is to understand what is that framework what is that model through which you try to understand a phenomena a question so once you uh, learn the art of doing that then you become a researcher so that is all about research methodology then after that you know there will be statistical tools and all those things which will be used but the, all that is within that framework once you understand what is that framework what is your model what is the way you look at this world once you are clear about that then the methods follow right the statistical methods are easier thing to do because there are packages there are you know different statistical packages and once you know the basic uh, uh, purpose of different methods and uh, how it works then you can easily run them using software but that is not the big deal that is not the major thing the major thing is are you asking the right question and are you uh, developing a type of abstraction which is needed for understanding that question are you developing a useful framework for that you know are you developing a good hypothesis that you wanted to look at it all this is what the essential of a research methodology now it is very difficult for anyone to teach this this has to be learned rather than be taught so what is the way to learn as i said earlier uh, it should be learned from top quality papers which are published in good internationally reputed journals in your respective field that help you to learn research methodology i don't believe that you can teach it in class so that is one thing now i will also want to spend one minute to say the usefulness of this abstraction which i said i said that you have to essentially abstract the complex world because sometimes people say that you know your your model or your research is too narrow uh, it is not uh, uh, realistic it is not capturing all aspects of uh, uh, what uh, what is going on in our society it is too narrow but i think that is not a, a right type of uh, criticism why i will i'll give you an example like you know you know um, you know a, a world map map of the world map of india or map of the world or map of your state or whatever so when you create a world map how are you generating a world map what is the method that you use for generating a world map a map for the world you are representing the whole world in a piece of paper Right? that is what you are doing you are representing the whole world in a piece of paper that is what is called a world map how is it possible for us to create a world map it is possible for us to create a world map because we are abstraction we are doing abstraction right it is a model building we are building a model for the world that is what is called a world map we are removing unnecessary details we are removing the details which we think is not very important some of the details are taken out only those which are most important are included in a world map because if you include everything all places in this world in a world map you cannot put it in a piece of paper because this world is so vast and you know complex so you cannot uh, represent each and every 
place in the world in a piece of paper. So you have to do abstraction. Necessarily, you have to do abstraction to create a map of the world. So then, uh, uh, by doing that abstraction, what you get is a very useful product. You will know how the world looks like in a piece of paper. This is what a researcher has to do. In your field, if you have a particular question, you have to simplify that in a way that makes it easier for us to understand. You should not make it complex because the world itself is complex. Now, if you make it further complex in, through our research, then there is no use of it. Right? It's like a world map. You, you put the world in a piece of paper. In the same way, we have to make the things simple and easier for to understand. The main, that means we have to necessarily do abstraction. You cannot explain everything that is going on in the world. If you try to explain everything that is going on in the world, you, you are complicating matters. Nobody understands anything. Right? You are explaining everything and that is not useful. So you have to simplify and think which are the most important aspects which you need to explain. And ignore uh, things which are less important. Focus on something that is most important. And therefore, you tell an uh, important story, right? an important uh, uh, you know, uh, finding. So like that, you, that is why we say that we need to focus. We need to have that focus. That focus is important not only in terms of asking the right type of question, it's also important in terms of how do you approach that question. Right? You ask a question, uh, a research question, there you need to have a focus. It has to be well-defined research question. And secondly, so there you need to be focusing. You cannot ask all questions. You have to ask only a specific well-defined questions in your research. Secondly, after asking that question, you also need to focus on your method, right? your framework, your model. You have to do abstraction. You have to ignore certain things which are not very, very important. You have to make assumptions. Right? All these have to be done. And also a model should not be judged on the basis of what type of assumptions you make. That is not the right way to evaluate whether a model or a theory is good or bad. The right way of evaluating whether a theory or a model is good or bad is only in terms of whether that model is useful or not to understand the world. You may be using some, uh, some assumption which may not look very realistic to some people, but that's okay. But uh, if you are uh, able to generate an explanation uh, which looks uh, good to understand the world, useful to understand this complex world, then you, your model is a good model. You can only say that there is no model that is true model. We cannot say that any model is true. We can only say some models are useful, some models are not useful. That is what we can say. So if you are, if you want to make a model or a theory that is useful, forget about what type of assumptions that you make. Don't judge it on the basis of which assumption you are making. It should be judged in terms of whether that model that you are finally arriving at, whether it is a useful model or not. That's it. Right. So this is broadly what I wanted to say about research methodology as a field. And um, uh, I, I hope I, I made that point. So I would suggest to all the young scholars uh, to, to, to uh, don't try to do any shortcut to learn research method. That will not work. The only uh, thing that will work is the hard work. What is the hard work? You have to read. What you should read? You should read the best journals and the articles published in the best journals in the world. Try to understand how people approach research in those papers and how do they frame a question? How do they go about analyzing it? What type of approach they use? What type of abstractions they make? What type of uh, quantitative or qualitative methods that they use? So you have to learn by doing it, by reading it and doing it yourself. Right? And uh, classes and lectures will help in a very minimum way. That's all. It is primarily your responsibility as an individual researcher. OK, so with that background, um, which is more general about it, I will let me come to 
um, the specific topic of today's discussion. The topic is about the global value chain. As I said earlier, uh, whether you are economist or a sociologist or a political scientist or whichever or geography scholar, whoever it is, I am saying that uh, no, it is important to understand this topic for everyone. Why? Because it is about the way this world is organized today. That is what the global value chain means. Which has implication for economists, it has implication for sociologists, political scientists, geographers, uh, like you know, all social scientists uh, 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 will learn something from it. So, what does it mean, global value chain? It means that uh, in today's world, production of different uh, commodities or products that we consume on our daily basis, whether it's a mobile phone or a computer. Or a, um, or a or the uh, the garments that uh, we wear, the dress that we wear, whichever product that we use on a daily basis, they how how are they manufactured? We are asked that question. How is the mobile phone that you all use? We all use mobile phone. How is it manufactured? It is not manufactured in one country, right? It is manufactured by a group of countries in the world. And each country uh, contributes something to the manufacturing of a mobile phone or a computer or any product, right? So this is called the production process in different industries are globally fragmented. They are all globally fragmented. It is not produced from start to end in any one country. It is uh, different components or parts in the production process are carried out in different countries of the world, right? Like you know, for example, when we when we buy a mobile phone earlier, it used to be written made in China or a computer made in China. Most of the electronic products made in China is what is written uh, 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 in the label. Just one second, I'll just one second. I Sorry. So uh, it is written made in China or made in India. A mobile phone is made in India uh, or made in China. So what does that mean? Does it mean that the entire mobile phone, uh, everything that is uh, uh, included in the production of the mobile phone, um, uh, is manufactured uh, is manufactured uh, entirely in that country where it is written made in that country? No, that is not the right thing because, um, like you know, now India is manufacturing iPhones, right? iPhones are manufactured in India. But what is happening in the case of iPhone is that uh, mostly all these component parts and components which are required for producing uh, in the mobile phone are imported from other countries. And different countries uh, manufacture different things, different parts. Uh, needed for producing a final good and then these parts and components are imported and then they are assembled in one country and and produce the final product so that the country where this final assembly takes place uh, get get the name that made in that country right so when uh, when you buy a product that is made in china so essentially it means that uh, china has imported all the parts and components from various countries of the world, and then they assemble it there, and they then make the final product, then export it from that nation. So where the final production takes place, that is basically assembly. That is where that label comes, made in that country. So that doesn't mean that the entire thing is made in that country. It is all globally fragmented. The different uh, uh, stages of the value chain takes place in different locations, right? So generally, the advanced countries, the rich countries, they specialize. They uh, specialize in certain stages in the global production, uh, global value chain. They specialize in more higher value added stages in the value chains, like uh, undertaking R and D or uh, uh, designing the products, marketing the products. 
so these are things which requires more technology more know how higher skills more capital and all that therefore they specialize in those things because why do they specialize in those things that is because uh, they have an advantage in terms of uh, you know they are capital abundant country so they have more capital more technology a more skilled labor force so they have an advantage in doing that therefore they specialize in doing that other countries uh, uh, contribute in the value chain by uh, becoming you know by uh, uh, supplying raw materials or some other intermediate goods or using labor they assemble the product final assembly takes place in uh, developing countries where wage costs are lower because to do assembly you need uh, more labor and uh, uh, the wage rates should be lower so firms do assembly in such countries so they they go to china they go to vietnam they go to india to do the final assembly because their labor is abundant and wage rates are relatively low so they make use of that advantage so in that process every country is engaged in that process and then uh, the final product is uh, uh, manufactured in that process everybody benefits everybody gains uh, a share everybody gets a share but uh, of course some countries get a larger share which countries get a larger share generally the richer countries get a larger share because they contribute in the higher value added segments of the uh, products value chain like uh, doing r and d doing designing of the products all these requires a higher uh, you know skill higher technology so you have to pay more for that so they get a higher stake higher higher uh, value from that for example the the mobile phone apple iphone uh, when china was manufacturing and exporting in uh, uh, the assembly that it was taking place in, in china the, mainly the it was the assembly that was taking place in, in china and they were getting just a 4 or 5 percentage of the total value of the product that is what is generated in china like uh, for example suppose that um, uh, the the price of one mobile phone is 100 dollars so china get only 4 or 5 dollars when they export a mobile phone worth of 100 dollars what the what chinese labor uh, makes or chinese uh, uh, people how how much they get out of that 100 dollars they get only 5 dollars or 4 dollars 4 to 5 dollars that is what estimates show the remaining 95 dollar is shared by different countries of the world a large part of that share goes to united states because uh, because uh, you no know, apple uh, is a uh, uh, that is their uh, you know the, the home country of apple is united states so they do the r and d and high value added activities in the us itself but they don't do the final assembly in the us because uh, final assembly if they do in us it becomes very costly so they wanted to do that in a developing country in a poor country where wages are low so they shift these activities or outsource those activities uh, in such country so but in this process many countries are participating like you know for example you know now, now this is not just uh, happening only in mobile phones or in uh, or in um, uh, computers or in aeroplanes not just in those type of technologically complex products not just in that even simple products like the garments the dress that we wear the shoes that we wear the footwear toys that we that we uh, that we get from the market all these are produced under this global value chain right bangladesh for example is a leading country in the export of garments they export a lot of garments bangladesh about a 90 percentage of their total exports are done but we know that bangladesh does not produce cotton they do not have cotton but they are the major exporter of garments how is that possible it is possible because uh, they import uh, cotton uh, cotton yarn from india and bangladesh india and pakistan and then they stitch cloth right and then stitch cloth and then they stitch cloth for the big brands which are those brands the adidas the nike and all these big brands 
and these are based in advanced countries these brands are based in advanced countries they do not manufacture these products they own brands and then they subcontract they they have a subcontracting arrangement with the firms located in bangladesh so they say that you stitch these many clothes you have to use this kind of uh, material for stitching this cloth and this is the way you should do it we will give you this much as your compensation for that so that bangladeshi firm has a contractual arrangement with the lead firm in the advanced country the brands and they do that and then they 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 supply this to them and then the big brands they they sell it in all over the world so that is how the global value chain in garments or apparel industry takes similarly uh, it, 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 it the same case is there in footwear industry shoe making adidas nike and all big brands in the world they 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 do production like that they organize production like that now in the total world commerce right world trade about two third of that is done by the big multinational companies the multinational companies means those who are have their operations in different countries two third of the global commerce are controlled by them and they do this under this global value chain they spread out in the world they specialize in different stages of the value chains in different countries and uh, then then uh, then uh, finally produce the good under that so when they produce it that way they are able to produce it at a relatively low cost and therefore uh, they they are able to get a larger share and uh, export their products in the world market so that is what global value chain essentially means it is it is there in all industries you cannot think about any industry where it doesn't occur even in agriculture even in agriculture like you know Uh, uh, uh like uh, uh, when we buy processed food products right so uh, like you know we know maggi noodles right maggi noodles or uh, any uh, that type of uh, britannia's biscuits or uh, uh, amul dairy products all these are agriculture products now how are they produced they are manufactured they are manufactured through the global value chain again raw materials come from some country processing takes place in some other country and uh, uh, retailing uh, and uh, you know the, the designing and r&d and all these takes place in different countries and then there are brands which are located in some country so like that this is happening all over the world in in different products like you know uh, you know these um, these barbie doll like you know the doll the, the toy that we buy the barbie doll so there are 16 countries involved in the manufacturing of the barbie doll right it's uh, uh, clothes are stitched in thailand it's uh, uh, you know the the, the the material the cloth that itself comes from some other countries its hair comes from sweden shoes comes from switzerland like that in you know, a bag comes from some other country so like that many countries are involved in doing they are specializing in a particular segments in the manufacturing of a, even a simple product like a dot even there we see global value chain so many countries are involved when india manufactured uh, covid vaccines we we say that it is indian made vaccine but that is a complete uh, uh, misleading type of description there are some uh, 30 40 countries involved in the manufacturing of this covid vaccine even though the final manufacturing took place here the ingredients that are needed for manufacturing that even including the technology these are supplied by other countries right so whether it is a pharmaceutical products vaccines uh, garments toys footwear computer a mobile phone aeroplanes whatever products that you can think about they are all occurring through this global value chain now the question is like you know if that is the case how is it relevant uh, why should uh, uh, you know economists or social scientists 
or a sociologist or political scientist all should bother about it right so um, economist obviously it is clear because it comes directly under the area of economics because it's about uh, how production is taking place in different industries so it is directly relevant i don't have to explain much but what about the sociologists so, uh, what about the political scientists so how about uh, geographers everybody should know about it why because uh, sociologists should know about it because there are people involved in it right there is labor involved in it uh, women workers uh, participate in assembly of mobile phones in large scale like uh, indian mobile phone iphones that are exported from india are assembled by women uh, workers mostly they are women workers in the bangladeshi garment workers are 85% are women right so there are issues related to what wages that they get how they uh, acquire their skill how it leads to social you know type of issues uh, social relations whether child labor is used you now all kind of issues come uh, in that whether there is an upgrading within value chain is taking place whether people move up acquire skills and move up in the value chain over time or whether they get stuck at a particular level so these are all issues which are directly uh, whether there are discrimination taking place whether there are unequal uh, gains uh, uh, are you know are taking place some some agents some groups gain other groups uh, do not gain that much distributional issues all these are important for all social scientists right whether you are a, a, a economist or a social sociologist for political scientist again it is important because uh, because uh, ultimately you will, uh, this, this is a matter of international relations right so where countries are integrated they are integrated they depend on each other right uh, so when uh, international relations uh, uh, when uh, people talk about uh, diplomacy when uh, uh, countries deal with uh, you know other countries in terms of business or politics they have to think about it like you know when the ukraine russia war took place uh, it affected the global value chains because they are part of very important part of this global value chain they are big suppliers of uh, ukraine was a big supplier of uh, uh, agriculture products like wheat and uh, russia was a big supplier of oil the, uh, the european countries uh, put the sanctions on on russia trade sanctions on russia so their trade got affected right so when this trade got affected the entire value chain global value chain got disrupted and that led to inflation and a price rise across the world right so so it has implications for international relationships it has implications for how do you deal with the with the uh, aftermath of war and conflict like you know so it has implications for diplomacy international relations international politics uh, social issues so sociologists should be knowing about it it has also implications in politics because you know the Uh, is a us election which was fought uh, uh, in the last uh, in the previous election not the one in which uh, joe biden became president before that when donald trump became president you know uh, at that time uh, us election was fought in the name of trade in the name of globalization in the name of global value chain right uh, that this was a political issue there in at that time in the election so uh, in that election donald trump said that the global trade uh, was not favoring and the united states was not benefiting from global trade developing countries like china is uh, you know big beneficiaries of globalization and they are benefiting and the us is not benefiting so we should do uh, you know something against china and these were issues that were Uh, discussed in the elections in the us election globalization related issues became an election issue in the in the us election and then after that after when donald trump became president he uh, uh, went for a trade war with uh, with china what is trade war he imposed 
restrictions on imports of goods coming from China. What is the argument? The argument is that China is benefiting, US is not benefiting from uh, from uh, from uh, uh, from trade. So they they put uh, uh, they they want to somehow control China, right? So then they put uh, uh, tariffs on Chinese products, and then uh, when they put tariff on Chinese products, uh, China retaliated. They also put tariffs on U.S. products that were coming to China. Uh, so that led to a trade war and tension, geopolitical issues. Now all these are linked to global values, right? So uh, why uh, why uh, Trump convinced the people that uh, China is a problem for them? The, it was easy for him to convince because when people, ordinary people, when they go to uh, market, supermarket to buy things, they look at from where the particular product is manufactured. They see everywhere made in China, made in China. Everything is made in China. Now, if everything is made in China, they think that there is something wrong with it. Right? China is doing something unfair. But the fact is that China is getting only a share of the total value of whatever is produced. The largest share is uh, generated in US itself. But that aspect, people, ordinary people do not know. Right? Ordinary people are misled. They are misled by saying that China is making huge money from this, uh, uh, from this trade. They do not know that when an iPhone was exported from China, China got only $5. Uh, $50 was generated in the US itself. Right? The final value of the iPhone is $100. Out of that $100, so in the export statistics, export data, it will show, in the trade data, it will show that the U.S. imported $100, uh, $100 worth of uh, mobile phone from China. That is what the U.S. trade statistics will show. But that trade statistics is very misleading because what happened in that $100, China got only $5. Out of the $95, about $50 US itself got. The remaining $45 different countries of the world got, including Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, all these countries which are involved in the global value chain for mobile phone production. So these aspects are never, never discussed, never understood by people. So politicians easily misled people. So that is why everybody should know about the global value chain. Because your politicians are cheating you. you are, they are giving you misleading information right? about uh, China, about uh, trade uh, surplus, trade deficit. All these things are uh, used in day-to-day -day discussion in politics, in international diplomacy, international relations, not just in economics. Right? So, so that is why uh, uh, it is important for or all social scientists to understand about how the world commerce, uh, trade, commerce, uh, investment, all this is taking place and how is it shaping politics, how is it shaping social relationships, uh, international relations, diplomacy. All these things are important to understand. We know that in the case of India-China uh, conflict, Right, so uh, uh, there was a border clash some time back, and that led to India taking certain actions against China. Now uh, uh, that led to certain tensions, and again in the newspapers we always read that you know India has a trade deficit with China. We should somehow address that. In the U.S., also similar issues are there. U.S. newspapers will report that they have a huge trade deficit with China. But think about this. If global value chains are organized in the way that I just discussed, if China is simply an assembly center, what will they do? They import parts and components from different countries in the world. And then they, using Chinese labor, they add value, right? Or they, or they assemble the products or make the final products and export. Now, if that is the case, China would be always exporting final products. And they will be always importing intermediate products. Now, the value of final product that they export to whichever country in the world will be always higher than 
the value of intermediate inputs that they import from other countries right so their exports will be generally higher than the value of their exports will be generally higher than the value of their imports we have to always also remember that china is not just an exporting country if you look at which are the major exporting countries of the world which are the five top exporting countries in the world the number for one will be china united states germany japan you know these big countries developed countries these are the number one, top 5 exporting countries if you ask the question which are the top 5 importing countries you will see the same list china is not just the top exporting country it is also the top importing country so when you create problems for china and uh, through a trade war or a united states is engaged in a trade war with china it is not that china only lose from that us also lose from it because china imports from us uh, to to manufacture those products so other countries also lose so china's decline is not other countries gain so there is some kind of fear uh, feeling that you know if you somehow uh, punish china then we gain from it that is not true because in international trade if you look at through the lens of global value chain what uh, you cannot think that one country's uh, gain is another country's uh, loss right if one country is losing other countries also lose imports and exports are two sides of the same coin in international business it is two sides of the same coin because um, why do we need a, uh, like you know a foreign exchange when we when we export something we earn for why do we need it we need it because when we import something we have to pay to that other country in terms of their currency so we need a foreign exchange then only we can import goods from other countries now if we are not importing goods from other countries and we are just earning foreign exchange what is the use of that foreign exchange it has no use right it is a waste if you are just keeping foreign exchange uh, keeping it accumulated in our central bank it has no use we are not utilizing valuable resources in a efficient manner so we have to use the foreign exchange to uh, get goods from other countries because if we don't use that then it is like a miser who just accumulate and die with that money without uh, uh, enjoying the benefit of that like for example russia today russia today runs a huge trade surplus how because they are exporting oil they are exporting oil to china they are exporting oil to india some other countries in the world so they are able to export oil because they are they are a oil rich country but they are not able to import they have a lot of import requirement but they are not able to import why they are not able to import because there are sanctions sanctions in, imposed by the us and the europe because of the ukraine war so therefore uh, china uh, the russia is not able to get technology they are not able to get the capital goods several things that they wanted to import from these countries which they used to import earlier they are not able to import so then what is happening the foreign exchange that they are earning is becoming a useless thing they don't have benefit from trade right from that export they just earn it that's it right unless you use it to get your things from other countries it is of no use now if import do not take place then who will be suffering it is the domestic consumers you and me like you know the, the citizens of that country will suffer because the prices of everything will go up right imports makes prices stable otherwise you have to produce everything yourself in your country then uh, if there is uh, some uh, you now some kind of shock um, um, you know a, a flood or a drought or whatever then supply or you know your supply will uh, will be affected and then prices will shoot up so consumers lose so imports help consumers imports help consumers to get things at a reasonable cost 
the american consumer benefited enormously because uh, china exported those goods to us so the consumers benefited their inflation in us remained at a very low level for several decades ever since china started exporting their products to the to the world market the global inflation stabilized the global inflation remained at a very low level but after the covid and also after the ukraine war there is a disruption in the global supply chain there was a disruption in the global supply chain that disruption led, led to major inflation across the world including in the advanced countries so the low level of inflation that the people of the advanced country enjoyed uh during 90s 2000s 2010s until recently disappeared because of a disruption and that disruption came from various reasons one is the trade war that uh, donald trump imposed the protectionism that uh, donald trump uh, started then the covid then the uh, the covid uh, disrupted you know the supply chains across the world then third is the war so all these disrupted the global value chains global supply chains and that led to a cost push inflation across the world right so we are not able to understand these and this affect our day to day life right we are we are living uh, essentially by exchanging right all individuals live by exchange we we give our we earn our salary from our work or from our or income from our agriculture products or whatever whatever activities that we do we all earn our income and then we exchange we use that income to buy other things so we are doing trade on a daily basis each one of us are engaged in trade on a daily basis so when these things happen at the international level we call it international trade right there also it is individuals who are engaged in that exchange firms or individual traders they are engaged in that exchange so we know that in our day to day life this trade is very important you know what happened during the demonetization during the demonetization trade got affected right we are not able to buy what we wanted uh, similarly during the covid lockdown trade got affected trade didn't take place right the, the lockdown means uh there is a disruption in everything so we are not able to buy our vegetables we are not able to buy our essential groceries right so we know the the hardship of that when there is no trade now think about that is so we understand in our day to day life there is so much of hardship when trade does not take place because we we are so much dependent on that we live by exchanging this is the statement given by the father of economics adam smith we live by exchange so for our life we need water we need air we need exchange also it sounds important that if that exchange gets disrupted whether it is in our local trade relationship or national within the country or even international it will have its consequences it affects everybody right so we need to understand that and um, this uh, this is this has the implications for everybody not just for economics it has implication for every individual right because we on a daily basis we are involved in it and we should know about it its implication right so i think i will stop here but uh, those of you who are very much interested in studying this there are materials uh, which uh, i can suggest like you know uh, world bank for example they publish world development report uh, every year and this world development report generally focus on a particular issue in each year so in 2009 2020 uh, world development report uh, uh, it's a special focus is on global value chains so those who wanted to study more about the global value chain how to do conduct research in that field i suggest you to go to world development report 2020 is published by world bank 
it's available online you can download it so you can see everything about it uh, how uh, you look at this phenomena how do you conduct research in that what are the databases that can be used what are the methods that can be applied all this you can study there today what i have said is a more general overview about it not going into the detailed technical aspects that i thought can be done in another occasion on another occasion so those who are particularly interested in that topic can look at it today my purpose is to make you all understand that it is important to know about this for everyone right we need not be an academician we as a just as an individual we should know about it because it affects our life on a day to day basis uh, because we are all depend on trade on our daily life right so we exchange things with our money right our services we sell right on a daily basis we are se selling our services we are getting money and then using that money we are buying something this is what countries do in export and import means essentially that what we do in our daily life when you extend that to nations we call it international trade nothing else that the logic is the exact same logic the only thing is that we are extending that at the level of a aggregate at the level of a nation so when you do that you are buying and selling and we know that buying and selling in our life is important for us right if we do not buy and sell we suffer similarly for nation if they are not allowed to buy and sell they also suffer there are costs right so with this i will stop here and uh, i will take questions from you uh, if there are questions okay uh, rupansi ji ha okay Ah, Rupansi ji, you are mute. Please unmute yourself. You are mute. Sorry, so sorry, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable session. Uh, I request everyone. I request the participants. If you have any question, you can raise your que queries here. Session is open for queries, guys. Shubhangi. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes. yeah. You are absolutely audible. Uh, namaste, sir. I am a research student of uh, Commerce Faculty, and uh, I am working on the topic supply chain management. Uh, I am thankful to you uh, for elaborating the concept of value chain. Uh, I have read uh, that value chain moves along the supply chain. Uh, can you please tell me? what is the relation between supply chain and uh, value chain and how these chains affect each other in general so, please sir yeah so they are very closely related like you know supply chain and value chain are not uh, essentially very different concepts so uh, like you know at each level in the supply like you know when you are manufacturing a product Uh, hmm. there are there are at the various levels uh, you know uh, uh, the, uh, the activities take place at various levels and each level means a particular supply chain right you are you yes. are you know as a firm you may be focusing in log some firms may be focusing in logistics that means they just hmm. transporting the product from the factory to the to the to the port that is the logistic supply chain. right when you and the firm is en engaged in the logistic supply chain they get a value from that service from that supply right what is the value that they get the value that you get is the you know the the, the, the remuneration that the logistics company is getting for that service right when they are providing that service they are charging they are they are charging for that service they are putting a charge so that is the value that they get so there there is a supply chain supply chain is the logistic the okay. value chain means the how much value that particular logistics company uh, make uh, when they are engaged in that particular supply chain how much they got from that how much they charge for that particular 
survey that they did. Like that, in the manufacturing of uh, any product, there are different levels of supply chains, and at each level of supply chain, value is generated. Okay. The weapon supply chain, more value is generated. Like, oh. you know, when, uh, when the uh, 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 computer is manufactured, you have to manufacture something like, you know, chips, for example, which is a very important uh, component for making computers. So the chips manufacturing firm will generate, that is one supply chain, right? Where, how the chips are manufactured. And yes, so that is one particular supply chain and they generate more value because uh, that is a high, uh, high technology uh, supply chain. So they, they, they get more value. Similarly, uh, firms have to do research and development to produce a yes, particular product. So doing research and development is a high value added activity that is also a part of the supply chain but it is also high value added so they get the high value then there are marketing after the product is manufactured and sold to the consumer uh, no at that process after the product is manufactured then it has to be sold uh, to the uh, to the consumer uh, through retail outlets and all that so this retail outlet is another supply chain they generate value then marketing is another supply chain. They also generate some value. So at each supply chain, some value is generated. And when you add all that value, which are generated at all supply chains together, you will get the total value of that. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Any other query? I request everyone to please come up with your questions. Uh, Sarmita De, you have raised your hand. Sarmita, do you have any query? Yes. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Uh, sir, uh... Uh, your uh, discussion was an interesting one. Uh, it was primarily with respect to international trade. Uh, so uh, my research area is in the area, you know, is in the context of organic and inorganic rice in particular. So uh, can, could you uh, throw a light on the difference between the supply chain of organic rice and inorganic rice? Is that possible? Can you throw some light on this? So I I do not know exactly to like you know describe how the supply chains uh, would be different for the two types of rice. That uh, I do not have the that much information about that. But then generally. Uh, in our understanding is that the organic, inorganic uh, rice supply chain would have been something that is uh, more well established. Uh, like, you know, for example, you know, which are the countries which are the major rice producers in the world. And they, like, you know, India is a major, India and Thailand uh, are major uh, producers of uh, rice uh, among few other countries. And then these rice, like, you know, certain countries, they get exported. Other countries, they do not get exported. So let us say Thailand is exporting this rice to another country. When the other country uh, use the exported the rice that is uh, purchased from Thailand to process it, to make it flour, and then uh, add value by processing it and uh, making a more higher value added food processing, uh, you know, uh, uh, a processed item like, you know, rice, cake or whatever. Uh, so you, so, so like that, the, that would be the kind of traditional value chain and that involves use of chemical fertilizers to manufacture, uh, to, to produce rice, the inorganic rice, you need uh, chemical fertilizers. So these chemical fertilizers may not be produced in Thailand. It may be produced in some other country like China, from which uh, Thailand may be importing that chemical fertilizer. Pesticides might be coming from some other country that is also needed for inorganic rice cultivation. So you need seeds also. 
now seeds may not be uh, it may be genetically modified seed or different varieties of seeds are available in the world sometimes multinational companies provide those seeds right so like that the value chains uh, are uh, uh, like uh, are there even in rice like so now when it comes to organic one the value chain will be slightly different in the sense that there you don't use chemical fertilizers and pesticides you have to use um, more natural way of uh, farming it so so the technology will be slightly different so so i would suppose that the value chain also will be different because there is no involvement of chemical fertilizers in organic rice cultivation pesticides are not there but in the other one those things also will be there. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, in the domestic market, um, is it um, you know is it a myth or is it reality that uh, organic uh, uh, rice uh, costing of processing organic rice say is more than uh, processing say organic inorganic rice? So, because uh, price of organic rice is higher in the domestic market, if I am confined to the domestic market only, right. co concerned with India. Yeah. So, uh, why is the price higher? Is it true that the factors that go into production of organic rice mm -hmm. is expensive? Like you have to take a lot of precautions, etc. Yeah. Or you need a lot of more, uh, say, knowledge. Uh, for which trainings are required and uh, or the demand uh, is like it's there's a niche market for organic no it is a, like you know it, it has to do with the mostly with the supply side reasons like you know why the prices of organic products are generally higher than the, uh, other traditional products because organic farming requires uh, uh, like you to use uh, you should not be using chemical fertilizer so when you do not use chemical fertilizers, then the yield will suffer a lot. Your yield will be very low, right? Because uh, chemical fertilizers boost the yield. And you cannot use, if you are doing truly organic farming, you cannot use chemical fertilizers. We cannot use uh, pesticides, chemical pesticides. So because of those requirements, then the yield per acre for organic uh, cultivation will be very low. So when the yield is low, then of course the price will be high because your labor effort uh, may be even higher. Right? You may have to take um, more precautions, more uh, effort to grow any crop organically. So labor effort is more, but uh, yield is less. That will of course lead to higher price. So that is simply the answer to that question because uh, no, you don't. Uh, the yield is very low for organic farming uh, because uh, there are crop losses and uh, because you don't use pesticides, you use a natural uh, fertilizers, natural uh, you know uh, way of uh, growing these things. So that uh, these all increases cost and uh, reduces yield. So therefore, the cost will be higher. And also, one more thing is that you know, in the traditional uh, farming, there is large scale. The scale is very large, right? When 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 we do the traditional farming, so uh, when the scale is large, the cost will be also low. Whereas organic farming is not done generally in large scale; they are done in smaller scale. So when you do something in a smaller scale, the cost per unit will automatically fall. That is an additional reason for that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for enlightening. Any other query? Any other query from any participant? Hello, sir. Yes. So, uh, thank you so much for your incredible speech, sir. So, what I want to ask you is, as you said, the U.S. is manipulating people about China being dangerous, then 
was there no intellectual property says and unfair trade practices by China first? Uh, can you, sorry, can you just repeat that question? I just uh, didn't get this properly. Can you repeat? Uh, uh, sir, you said that the U.S. is manipulating people about China being dangerous, right? Mm. Mm. So my question is, was there no intellectual property case and unfair practices by China? So was it, like, was it all a lie that you is making up? So you are asking about intellectual property, right? Yes, sir. Can you just write your question in the chat okay. box? OK, OK. It would yes, be yes. more clear. Yeah, just to just put it on the chat box so that. Yeah. OK, sir. OK, I will do that. So in the meanwhile, if somebody else has a question, they, they can ask. So, uh, Chamas sir, please uh, put it on chat box. Yes, yeah. I have uh, write it down. I got your question. So uh, you said that US is manipulating people about China being dangerous. Then was there no intellectual property theft and unfair trade practice? Okay, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I understood. So. Uh, Yes, there would be like, you know, so I am not saying that everything that is going on in China is all fair and, uh, you know, correct thing that they are doing. There are, there are, there are those kind of, uh, you know, uh, issues and all that, that would be there. But there are ways in which those, uh, those uh, intellectual property theft and etc. can be, you know, handled. Like, you know, there are institutional arrangements uh, for doing that. So if there are real manipulations or real uh, stealing of technology, etc. Other countries can always take any country to WTO. So the way to handle such issues, if there are complaints about unfair practices that any country is doing, there are international uh, institutional arrangements to deal with such issues. So the way out for that is to strengthen those type of institutional arrangements like World Trade Organization, right, where intellectual property rights related issues are part of the mandate of the WTO. So if any country is doing anything that is considered unfair, and if there is a evidence for that, right, then, then these kind of issues can be sorted out. So the way out is not to like unilaterally say that you are doing something wrong, but to argue the case and uh, show that and then there are mechanisms to address that problem uh, at the international level these, these so instead of going for that uh, what the politicians are doing is that they are taking the law in their own hand and then arbitrarily accusing you know another country of doing something unfair uh, they may be doing unfair i'm not saying that they may be doing but it has to be done in a proper process. Otherwise, there is no there is no discipline, and anybody can accuse anybody, uh, you know, on anything. Like you know, for example, in our country, let us say there are no court settlements are not done in court. It is done on the basis of our uh, individual, uh, you know, uh, uh, muscle power. Then you know how the situation will become bad, right? There is no there's a violation of you know rule and law and order in the country so you have to if there is something wrong somebody is doing there are ways in which it can be addressed in our country or any other country the usual way is to go to the court to to find a solution internationally also there are such a solution like uh, there are international bodies these international bodies like the people need to be strengthened to 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 address such problem rather than unilaterally taking action against a, any country. So when China becomes a major exporter, we, we have seen that uh, the benefits uh, are spread in the world. It is not like China alone benefited from that. Everybody benefited from that. Because value added is generated across the world. So, so just saying that it is all China uh, that is exporting this is wrong because it is other countries are also benefiting from when China is exporting. When China is exporting mobile phones, China gets only five dollars. This gets ninety-five dollars. So what is the point in saying that they are stealing? So I don't 
fully understand that. And if at all there are such issues, it is need to be addressed in appropriate international forum and uh, through proper process have to be followed. That is what WQ does. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, I wanted to ask you uh, in relation to Cha in relation to Bangladesh, uh, the area that you had covered that Bangladesh is uh, really doing very well regarding exports. Yeah. Uh, what is the edge that they have over India? Is it some factor related to supply chain management or something else? Good question. So, uh, like you know, if you start by looking at it uh, like you know india and uh, bangladesh if you compare we say, we can say that india has all the advantages india has better advantages than bangladesh in terms of excelling in garment production we should be doing much better than bangladesh right because we have the raw material in our country we grow cotton and we have a rich history of uh, industrialization in textiles textile industry we have a rich history so we have the entrepreneurship, we we have the know-how, we have the raw materials, we have the labor. So we have everything. Now, our textile industry, however, did not grow uh, rapidly uh, after uh, you know, this uh, trade opening like, uh, economic, during the economic reform. There are various reasons. Uh, in, whereas in China, in Bangladesh, they, 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 they benefited from that. One reason, there are many reasons. So one is that they effectively, they integrated their textile industry into this global value chain. So they became very important part of this global value chain in textile. They, the lead firms, the major brands that are located in advanced countries, they, they had established subcontracting arrangements with Bangladesh firms because the wages are low there, there is enough labor. That is uh, uh, one reason. So they wanted them to manufacture these things there. But there is also another reason why they did it in Bangladesh, but not in India. One is that the Bangladesh has this LDC status. They had this LDC status, this developed country status, which they are going to lose very soon because they are now becoming a middle income, lower middle income country. Uh, so, so. Uh, because of them having an LDC status, they have a very kind of some special uh, treatment. They get some special treatment in the international market. The tariff rates that uh, some countries uh, impose on products that are coming from LDCs, these developed countries are relatively lower. So there is an advantage for the big firms to go and set up uh, their contract relationship in Bangladesh so that you know these uh, these products can go to can be exported from Bangladesh to those countries at a relatively lower duty imported duty so that is one thing the other thing is that in India uh, like you know even though we have all these advantages all these advantages that we have the, the, we have not opened up this sector for uh, global value chain integration in a major way because we put all kind of restrictions on imports uh, right our tariff rates are very high for uh, textile related products and uh, uh, you know but bangladesh tariff rates are very low for textiles so they allow duty free import of intermediate products but we don't allow that of course, we have intermediate uh, inputs uh, here available in our own country, but still we put a high tax, even when it is available here. Why we wanted to do that? Because when these global companies have to come to operate in India, they have to import various things. It is not like just uh, uh, cotton or yarn. They have to use, uh, get uh, uh, synthetic materials, they have to use the machinery, textile machinery, uh, chemicals, paintings, all kind of things that have to be imported for the value chain to develop. Now, this value chain, if it has to be properly developed here, they, 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 uh, the global companies will come here only if all such things can be imported uh, relatively uh, at a cost, at a tariff rate, which is lower. 
but india has imposed the high tax on many things many intermediate goods so therefore it affects uh, our competitiveness that is another uh, that is a disadvantage that we have whereas in bangladesh their tariff rates for textile product in that industry is very low compared to india and also they have some advantages in that advanced country market because of their special treatment that they get in that market but that special treatment is now going to end because now bangladesh is moving out of the ldc category uh, so that is going to uh, uh, going to end now that is another thing then uh, one more thing which is affecting our labor intensive industry particularly um, apparel industry is the labor laws labor laws in india are generally considered to be very rigid compared to international standards because uh, uh, labor hiring and firing is not available uh, as much as needed here because uh, the law says that there is this industrial dispute act which says that if the firm is employing workers above certain number like you know it used to be 100 in some states it is now increased to 300 in some states so if we are employing workers above that level 100 in some states and 300 in some states then if you want to retrench worker right then you have to get um, government's permission to do that now generally this permission no government gives right so when government do not give such permission then still some firms may retrench but they do it illegally right and by bribing trade union leaders or politicians and all that so then that increases the cost and uh, that also this incentivizes uh, firms to enter into labor intensive sector because if you enter into labor intensive sector and employ say some thousand workers then you come under industrial dispute act when you come under industrial dispute act you have to deal with it. right whenever your demand international demand uh, has gone down you will have to get rid of some worker right but getting rid of that worker becomes difficult for you so when because the law do not permit you to do that then you employ them some of them on contract basis or something you do but it effectively all this co- increases the cost increases the uncertainty of uh, of uh, doing business in labor intensive sector in india so the labor intensive sector has not uh, uh, not uh, expanded so it is a combination of various factors labor law played an important role our trade policy which is highly protectionist even now uh, uh, is another important factor so we are not very much uh, important player in this global value chain and uh, much of the world trade in all products are happening through that and we are kind of cut off from that and uh, that led to you uh, know this type of situation thank you so much okay uh, thank you uh, any participant want to ask the question in the hindi medium so uh, you can ask without hesitation and rupansi and uh, uh, manorma are here so both will be translate your question anybody want to ask in hindi okay sir sure uh, koi hindi uh, ha koi hindi medium ka vidyarth uh, scholar puchna chahta ho hindi mein to aap hindi mein question kar sakte hain aur sir uska uh, jawab dene ki koshish karenge अदरवाइज हम लोग इन करेंगे सेशन को जी आप लोगों की कोई भी क्वेरी है यू आप हिंदी में पूछ सकते हैं प्लीज डोंट हेजिटेट सो अगर आपको थोड़ा सा भी पूछने में हेजिटेशन हो रहा है तो फिर आप चैट बॉक्स में भी लिख सकते हैं अदरवाइज वी विल मूव टूवर्ड्स द क्लोजर ऑफ द सेशन uh so okay uh 
I think uh, uh, there is no any query. So, Rupansi ji, please to go ahead. Okay. Uh, I guess we assume that there are no more queries. Okay. So, shall we uh, move towards the closure of the session? Sir. Sir, should we close the session for the day? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, sir. So, for giving us your valuable insights on uh, so energy. because uh, Barupan Sajji Manorma is here, so yeah. she will be give the formally vote up. Thanks. Yeah. So I request Miss Manorma to please uh, mm -hmm. uh, close the session. Um, yes, Be thank you. Uh, a very good evening to everyone. Uh, so now, as we have come to the end of this session, uh, it is my privilege to extend a vote of thanks to all those who have made this. Uh, seminar webinar possible uh, so first and foremost i would like to express my sincere gratitude to our eminent speaker professor c viramani for sharing his invaluable insights and expertise with us and especially the way sir has summarized the research methodology in this one statement which caught my attention uh, research is something to be learned not something to be taught so this is you know a very good summary of this whole research methodology because it's a process you learn and it's you evolve your own strategy to uh, work on your research. Uh, so, sir, your knowledge and experience has uh, provided us with a deeper understanding on both the topics, especially the topic for today, which was uh, global value chain, trends, patterns, and consequences. Thank you so much, sir, for your insights. Uh, secondly, I would like to uh, thank our moderators, Papi Halder, Praveen Kumar, uh, and Rupanshi Prati for seamlessly facilitating this session. And in the end, I would like to thank all our participants for their active involvement and for staying with us till the end. So thank you, everyone, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs>